And uh, suddenly there was this scream. It hit one of the females in the pod and she screamed. It's like a woman screaming. It was really eerie. And she rolled onto her side in a fountain of blood. And suddenly the largest whale in that pod slapped the water with his tail and disappeared. And he swam right up underneath of us and he threw himself out of the water straight at the harpooner on the Soviet vessel to defend his pod. And they were waiting for them. He knew they knew he would do that. And they had an unattached harpoon thrown into the cannon real quick. And at point blank range, he pulled the trigger and hit that whale in the head uh, with this explosive tipped harpoon. And that whale screamed and fell back into the water, thrashing about in incredible agony on the surface in his own blood. And as he, as he rolled on the surface, I caught his eye. And he looked straight at us, and then he dove again. And now I saw him come, a trail of bloody bubbles coming straight at us real fast. And he came up and out of the water at an angle so that the next move was to come right there and fall right on top of us to crush us. And we had seen all of this in the, you know, the old woodcuts about Yankee whalers being attacked by you know, wounded uh, sperm whales. And uh, it is a very awesome sight to suddenly see a creature that big with a lower jaw with teeth six to eight inches long suddenly rise up and come bearing down on top of you. And as his head rose up out of the water and I looked into his eye, an eye the size of my fist, it was right there, I saw something that changed my life forever. I saw understanding. He understood what we were trying to do. And in all his pain, he suddenly I could see his muscles move and he pulled himself back. And instead of coming forward to fall on top of us, he pulled himself back and he began to slide back into the sea. And I saw his eye disappear beneath the surface and he died. He could have killed us and he chose not to do so. And so that made me personally indebted to that whale for the fact that I'm alive. And, but I saw something else in that eye too, something that's haunted me ever since. And it was pity and not for himself, but for us, that we could take life so thoughtlessly that we could destroy it without any remorse at all. And I said, why were the Russians killing these whales? You can't eat sperm whale meat. It was used to make sperm oil and spermaceti oil, which is used for as a high heat resistant lubricating oil in, in sophisticated machinery. And one of the products that they are using spermaceti oil to manufacture was intercontinental ballistic missiles. And I said to myself, here we are, destroying this incredibly intelligent, socially complex, sentient creature for the purpose of making a weapon meant for the mass extermination of human beings. And that's when it struck me. We are insane. And from that moment on, I said to myself, I don't do what I, I'm going to do for, pe for people. I do what I do for whales or for sharks or for the creatures of the sea. So that puts us beyond criticism. We don't care what people think about what we do or how we do it. A few years later, we sank half of Iceland's whaling fleet at Dockside in Reykjavik Harbor and destroyed their whale processing plant. It was a $10 million hit on their uh, whaling industry. It took them 17 years to recover. In that 17 years, they didn't kill any whales at all. And the people who were most angry at me were my fellow conservationists. And one of my colleagues from Greenpeace came up and he says, I think you should know that what you did in Iceland was unforgivable, reprehensible illegal and, uh, and he says, I think you should be ashamed of yourself for doing that. And I said, so? And he said, well, I think you should know what people in this movement think about what you did. I said, John, we didn't sink the, that, those whaling ships for, for you or for Greenpeace or for any human being on the planet. We sank them for the whales, John. Find me one whale anywhere on this planet that disagreed with what we did <laughs> and I promise you we will not do it again. And the amazing, the amazing thing is, we've been doing this for over three decades. We have never caused a single injury to a single person, and we've never been convicted of a felony crime, ever. We've got an unblemished record that way, because we go after criminals. These are poachers. And after sinking those ships in Iceland, oh, they called us everything, criminals, terrorists, and everything. I finally got fed up with it because they wouldn't answer my letters. Because, uh, so I, I had to fly to Reykjavik and demand that they arrest me. And I landed at the airport, there's 150 police officers there, and the chief immigration officer, and he comes up, he says, oh, well, Captain Watson, how long do you intend to stay in our country? I said, I don't know, five minutes, five days, five years? <laughs> you tell me. Uh, oh, well, we have to go to interrogation. I said, oh, it sounds like fun, let's go. So we went off to interrogation, he says, are you admitting to sinking these ships? I said, you know, we sunk them, we're going to sink the other two at the first opportunity. 
The next morning, they put me on a police car, drove me to the airport, put me on a plane, and told me to go back to the States. Uh, the Minister of Justice stood up in the House and says, who does he think he is? He comes into our country and demands to be arrested. Get him out of here. <laughs> they knew that to put me on trial would be to put themselves on trial. You know, Japan has not charged us with anything, not a single charge. The Dutch have not charged us on the flagship, but they're putting pressure. So when I came back into the States recently uh, from Canada, I was suddenly, uh, I was stopped and uh, Homeland Security said, oh, you've got to go sit over there for two hours, miss the plane. I said, what's this all about anyway? They're all very friendly. And the guy says, well, Japan's put out a complaint that you're a terrorist. <laughs> oh, does that mean I'm off to Guantanamo or something? I mean, uh, and the guy looked at me and said, well, no, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a lot of paperwork. It doesn't mean anything at all. But every time I go back in, I constantly have to sit there while they go through the paperwork. And uh, the last time I came back, I was coming from London to Dallas and uh, at Dallas Airport. And I said, look, why don't you just save our, both our times and just send me straight to secondary? And he said, why would I do that? I said, oh, I'm on your list. He said, what'd you do to get on the list? Oh, we're saving whales down in Antarctica and Japan's called us terrorists. He says, oh, I can't believe that. Well, look it up. It's on your computer. And he uh, looks it up. He says, oh, this is ridiculous. He <laughs> says, he says oh, just get going, just get going. But, uh, and then what happened in August is that I... Uh, I, got to, I, I booked ahead to get a ticket to Australia, and suddenly they said, oh, well, you can't get a ticket. Your visa's been denied. I thought, oh, well, nobody's ever denied me a visa to Australia before. So I went to the Australian embassy, and they said, oh, well, you have to get a special visa. It, you need to get a three-month business visa. Oh, okay. So, well, and I applied for it. Then they came back and said, oh, well, we need criminal record checks from the FBI, from Canada, from Norway, and uh, before we, we, we can give you that visa. And uh, I said, I don't have a criminal record in America. And they said, well, you have to get a, a criminal record saying you don't have a criminal record from the FBI. <laughs> Do you know how hard it is to get a criminal record report from the FBI if you don't have a criminal record? <laughs> it's easier if you have a criminal record, you know. Uh, and then they said, well, that's going to take 120 days. Well, that means I couldn't get into Australia to take the ship. So uh, thanks to the Green Party here in Australia and uh, and Bob Brown and, uh, and Ian Campbell and people like that who, uh, and thousands of people who signed petitions, I was suddenly called up by the Australian Embassy to say, okay, you have uh, an unre unrestricted one-year visa. And in fact, <laughs> although they said it was routine, they were also denying visas to my officers and my bosun and everything else. So, but they, they turned that over. So that was because of pressure from, from people here in Australia on, uh, on the government. Now, two months before this government was elected, Peter Garrett stood up in Parliament and he said, with the Howard government, it's all smoke and mirrors. It's all pretty pictures of whales. It's all talk and it's no action. A Rudd government will take action. A Rudd government will take Japan to court. A Rudd government will send a ship down there to protect our whales. A Rudd government will end whaling. And we all voted for him, naive as we are. And turns out, They've done less than the government prior to that. And Ian Campbell's now on Sea Shepherd's advisory board. Uh, what is it with these people when they get elected? I think they take you into a back room and beat sense into you or something and tell you what reality is or something. Like, you might have been elected by the people, but you really work for us. You know, I voted for President Obama. It was a good example, you know. And a year later, I'm wondering why. He hasn't done anything, really. Again, I think they take you into a back room and the oil companies pretty much tell you what you're going to do. But uh, so the solution isn't going to, what I'm saying here is the solution isn't going to come from government. It never does. Governments cause problems. They don't solve problems. Problems are solved by the passion of individuals. Always has been, always will be. Slavery was ended in America and in Europe, not because of Abraham Lincoln or anything. It was ended because of people like Wilberforce and uh, and Douglas. And women got the vote in the United States again, not because of Woodrow Wilson, who was opposed to it right up until the moment he signed the bill. He was forced to do that, and then he got all the credit for it. But it was all those women who went out and you know, actually got beaten up and arrested and thrown in prison to get that vote. And when you look at it, everything in history has been done, that has been achieved, has been done by the passion of individuals. Because of Diane Fossey, we have mountain gorillas. Because of the work of Jane Goodall, you know, in her work with chimpanzees, Baruti Galdikos, with her work with orangutans, because of David Wingate, a man most people haven't heard of, but because in Bermuda, this man dedicated his life to protecting the Bermuda storm petrel, a little bird, again, that most people didn't hear of. But the fact is it would be extinct if it wasn't for him.